dinner time? No. Thanks, Max. Classical conditioning is a type of learning where an organism learns to associate one stimulus with another one. So this is a kind of learning that focuses on the antecedents. You know, the antecedents, those are those events or stimuli that precede some kind of behavior. Um, also, classical conditioning focuses a lot on reflexes. You know, the kinds of behaviors you don't have to learn, the kinds of behaviors you just naturally engage in. So classical conditioning was first discovered by Ivan Pavlov. And we've talked about Ivan Pavlov a little bit before. He's uh, a researcher. He was a physiologist. So he, he wasn't a psychologist at all. He was a physiologist who was literally studying, you know, dog spit. He was looking at digestion using dog subjects. And what he would do in his study is he would present the dogs with some meat and measure the amount of spit they produce. Now the interesting thing about his research was he was starting to realize that the dogs were learning to anticipate the presentation of this meat. So before the meat was even presented to the dogs, they would start salivating like crazy. And this was kind of, you know, puzzling. Like he didn't know how the dogs were doing this, but then he thought about it and he really looked at what was going on and he realized that the dogs had learned to associate this bell that he was ringing right before dinner time with the presentation of the food. So the dogs had learned that that bell means food is coming. So because he's the one who discovered this classical conditioning by accident, we tend to call it, you know, Pavlovian conditioning, or sometimes we call it respondent conditioning. Now, uh, his early research with dogs was really influential, and eventually this line of research was brought to the USA by a researcher by the name of John Watson who studied classical conditioning specifically in human participants. So here's a few basic terms of classical conditioning. These are like Pavlovian kind of conditioning terms. So you have your neutral stimulus. A neutral stimulus, or an NS, is one that just doesn't produce a response. Like if I were to show you a neutral stimulus kind of like this, that's probably not going to make you really react in any way. It's, it means nothing to you. Then you have unconditioned stimuli, or UCS. So an unconditioned stimulus is one that you just automatically, reflexively react to. So it's one that is innately capable of producing a response. I don't need to teach you to respond to an unconditioned stimulus. And then finally, you have the conditioned stimulus. So the conditioned stimulus is one that evokes a response because it has been repeatedly paired with a condition, with an unconditioned stimulus. So what I'm saying is this conditioned stimulus, this CS, it used to be neutral. It used to mean nothing. But then after repeatedly pairing it with an unconditioned stimulus, it starts to kind of associate with that unconditioned stimulus and it gets the same meaning. And then you have two kinds of responding. You have the unconditioned responses, the, the UCR. These are those reflexes I was talking about. These are things that the person just automatically does when exposed to an unconditioned stimulus. And then you have conditioned responses. These are learned responses that are produced by conditioned stimuli. So whenever it comes to these terms, you can always replace the word conditioned with learned. So we have unlearned stimuli that produce an unlearned response. Then we have learned stimuli that produce a learned response, and so on. H here's a little demonstration of how this works. So you see we've got a little doggy here. Now when we present this bell 
to the doggy. Uh, the, the dog doesn't, you know, react. It means nothing to the dog at this point. Now, if we were to instead present food to the doggy, then the dog is going to react big time. It's going to have that kind of unconditioned response where it's going to start salivating and getting excited because it wants to eat the food. And in this case, the food is that unconditioned stimulus. So the way classical conditioning works is we present something kind of like, you know, the bell, which produces no response. It's neutral with the food that automatically does produce that kind of response, that reflex. So after repeatedly pairing these two things together, eventually we're going to get the dog to respond to the bell, because now that bell has become associated with the food, and it has changed from a neutral stimulus to a conditioned stimulus, and it can produce a conditioned response. So the food no longer needs to be present for the dog to act as though food actually is there. This period of you know, association, this period where you're associating the neutral stimulus with the conditioned stimulus, that's the acquisition stage. So this is that period during which the response is strengthened, the behavioral response, that conditioned response, is strengthened by repeatedly pairing the neutral stimulus with the conditions unconditioned stimulus. You could also just call this the training period, and it's definitely a gradual kind of a thing. So the more you present these two things together, the stronger that conditioned response is going to be. Even if you spend a lot of time and you fully condition a response, so you, you fully associate this neutral stimulus with the unconditioned stimulus, once you take away that unconditioned stimulus, once, once the food stops being presented in the case of our dog, eventually that conditioned response is going to start to fade. It's going to become extinct, is what we call it. So extinction is when you weaken a conditioned response by taking away the unconditioned stimulus. So it, that's also a gradual process, you know, over repeated, you know, lack of pairing, over repeated presentation of the conditioned stimulus alone, eventually the animal is going to respond less and less and less and less and less until it gets to the point where it's basically not responding at all anymore. At this point we could say that the conditioned stimulus has reverted back to a neutral one. But something interesting sometimes happens. So even after you've getting, gotten to this point where the, uh, the behaviors become completely extinct, if you wait a little while and come back later, you might see something called spontaneous recovery. So this is where that condition response just suddenly reappears after what seemed to be full extinction. So it's not fully understood why sometimes we get spontaneous recovery, but it does seem to happen sometimes. It's almost as if the animal kind of just remembers that this stimulus meant something at some point. So here's a demonstration of how this extinction works. Like I said, when a after you've fully conditioned a response, if you take away that unconditioned stimulus and you only present the conditioned stimulus alone, over time, after repeated presentations, that re the animal will respond, start to respond less and less and less until finally it gets to a point where it's not responding at all anymore. So at this point, we would say the conditioned stimulus has reverted back to a neutral one. But like I said, sometimes after, even after you get to this point, if you take a break, you know, come back on another day or come back at another time, you might see a little bit of what we call spontaneous recovery. There's something interesting that can happen sometimes during classical conditioning, and that's called stimulus generalization or discrimination. So when an animal is being conditioned to, you know, respond to a certain kind of stimulus, like a bell, we might find that the animal will also respond to other things that are similar. So, sure, you know, we can condition a dog to start salivating when it hears a bell, but if we make a buzzing sound, like if we have a buzzer noise, and the dog salivates to that also, then we would say that the animal has generalized. So it's, even though we never trained it to respond that way to a buzzer, 
it just kind of naturally generalizes that response. Now that can happen, and that often does happen. But we can teach most animals, including you know humans, to discriminate. So the way you would teach discrimination is by selectively pairing different kinds of similar you know, stimuli. So in the case of the bell, we could purposefully associate that bell sound with food. So we ring the bell, present the food. While simultaneously, like on alternate trials, we could also make that buzzer noise and present it with nothing and uh, make other noises and present them with nothing. So we're, we're simultaneously associating the bell with food and other similar noises with nothing. So this will teach the animal to respond differently to different kinds of similar stimuli. After you've conditioned a response, after you've associated a uh, conditioned stimulus with an unconditioned stimulus, now you can do something called higher order conditioning. So higher order conditioning is basically when you just kind of take these two stimuli that you've linked together and you add another link. So it's, we're just chaining together uh, stimuli and response. So here's what I mean. In the pr previous example, we associated our neutral stimulus of a bell with food. So whenever the dog heard the bell, that, w that became conditioned, and the response was the conditioned response was salvation. Now that we've done that, now we can, right before we ring the bell that the dog salvates to, right before we ring that bell, we could, I don't know, flash a light. So the dog sees the light, hears the bell, and starts salivating because of the bell, because we've conditioned that bell. So after repeated pairings of the bell and the light, eventually the dog will kind of transfer that conditioning from the bell to the light. So we're just kind of going another step. We're, we're attaching another link, if you want to say that. So now we're basically just using our conditioned stimulus, the bell. We're treating it as though it's an unconditioned stimulus. And you can link together. You can create long chains of this kind of uh, conditioning, this higher order conditioning. And depending on the animal, you can have numerous links in the chain. The thing about uh, Pavlov is that he didn't really talk much about thought. Remember, if you think back to when we were talking about the behaviorists and behaviorism, a lot of these early behaviorists, including Pavlov, you know, the contributions of thoughts and feelings and stuff like that, it didn't matter to them. That, that wasn't interesting. All that they really talked about was behavior, you know, chaining stimuli and response and that kind of stuff. So that's, things are different now. Uh, behaviorism is not the major, the most major direction that psychology is going nowadays. What, if you remember, the most major branch, the most recent major branch is cognitive psych. So a lot of modern psychologists tend to think about how the animal understands and appraises and considers the stimuli when it comes to classical conditioning. So they take a more kind of informational view. We're just trying to argue that animals, we're, they're not just reacting to stimuli, they're actively looking for associations between stimuli. We're trying to make sense of the world around us. Now, classical conditioning works the same for humans as it does for other animals, but this is a relatively newer idea. This wasn't really well understood until a researcher by the name of John Watson, I mentioned him earlier, came along and did something we refer to as the Little Albert experiment. Now, in this Little Albert experiment, there was a little baby boy, uh, around the age of maybe one to two years of age, and he was exposed to various kinds of stimuli. You know, he's put in an, into a little room with lots of interesting toys and allowed to explore. But then at some point during the experiment, the researcher introduced a the white rat, like a fluffy little white rat. This was a, a neutral stimulus for little Albert. He'd never seen a white rat before, and he didn't really know what to do. He, he showed some interest in it, but he didn't really react. So we could say at this point, the white rat was a neutral 
stimulus. But then what Watson was trying to do was use classical conditioning with this rat. So what he did is he associated this rat with the unconditioned stimulus of loud, like a loud, fearful sound. So he would present the rat to the baby, and once the baby kind of noticed the rat and took interest in the rat, then he would make a really loud bang sound right behind the child's head, frightening the child. And after only a few trials, what he found was that the child became exceptionally fearful of this rat. So simply noticing the rat somewhere in the room, the, the child would you know, react really fearfully, like freak out and start crying trying to get away from it. And this fear reaction, this conditioned emotional response actually generalized pretty far. It got so bad that this this baby, you know, little Albert, was showing this kind of a fear reaction to anything white and fluffy. He, he even generalized so far as to become clearly fearful of a white Santa Claus beard that you know John Watson would wear and just go into the room. So it's kind of a, a sad you know example because you feel bad for the little baby, but it definitely clearly shows that you know humans can get this kind of classical conditioning just as well as any other animal. And it further goes on to provide some information about how things like phobias work. So th what the child gained in this example is a conditioned emotional response. So some just random stimulus, some meaningless stimulus, when associated with something that is legitimately fearful, would then transfer that fear to the previously neutral stimulus. So this is just one you know, explanation as to how we can become terrified of silly things. Like, it's probably not too reasonable to freak out like this when you see a little white rat. But some fear reactions definitely make more sense than others. Now, we're going to talk about phobia a lot, uh, much l later in this series of videos. But the basic idea is this, is that we have a genetic predisposition. We have these like genetically programmed tendencies to be afraid of certain kinds of things, like loud noises, for example. Uh, these, these things that we tend to be afraid of do tend to be life-threatening. So if you're afraid of spiders, I'd say that's perfectly normal. Spiders, some spiders can kill you. Same with snakes, same with heights, uh, tight spaces, you know, all these things are potentially life-threatening. So we do tend to develop phobias for these kinds of things. And this is the basic idea that was proposed by Martin Seligman in 1972. He just argues that most of our common fears are related to the survival of our species.